What is grace? Grace is community. Grace is passion. Grace is for everyone. Now we continue our series on the foundations of the church. We are looking at what makes our church a foundational community, a place that works together and does God's work. Last week on Founders Day, we looked at how important unity is and that that what's important is not who is in charge or who gets credit. It's that we work together for the glory of God. This includes people who have been here for years and years, as well as people who are brand new to this place. Everyone gets to be a part of this work to make the world a better place. We just have to keep our focus on being a team doing this incredible work together. Now we transition from unity to carrying each other's burdens. This is putting, again, the hands and feet on what it looks like to be in unity, working together. We work for the benefit of one another. We're going to hear our scripture from Joe, and it comes from the book of Galatians. This is a letter written by the Apostle Paul about what it takes to be a Christian. At the time, the Jewish Christians in Galatia said, you have to obey the cultural rules of being Jewish in order to really truly be a Christian. Paul has a thing or two to say about that, so let's listen for what it really takes to be a Christian. This is from Galatians 6, 1 through 10. Hear now the word of the Lord. Good morning. Uh, If you choose to follow along, uh, this reading is on page 191 in the New Testament section of your pew Bibles. My friends, if anyone is detected in a transgression, you who have received the Spirit should restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Take care that you yourselves are not tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. For if those who are nothing think they are something, they deceive themselves. All must test their own work. Then that work, rather than their neighbor's work, will will become a cause of For pride, for all must carry their own loads. Those who are taught the word must share in all good things with their teacher. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. You reap whatever you sow. If you sow to your own flesh, you will reap corruption from the flesh. But if you sow to the spirit, you will reap eternal life from the spirit. So let us not grow weary in doing what is right, for we will reap at harvest time if we do not give up. So then, whenever we have an opportunity, let us work for the good of all, and especially for those of the family of faith. And from Luke 12, 33, Jesus says, Sell your possessions and give alms. Make purses for yourselves that do not wear out, an unfailing treasure in heaven where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. The word of the Lord for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's join together in prayer. Lord, may we be an inclusive community passionately following Jesus Christ. Work in us your will as we seek to carry one another's burdens the right way. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Carrying one another's burdens may sound like a simple command on its surface, but it is a deceptively sneaky concept. Even the Apostle Paul says both bear one another's burdens and all must carry their own load. What does it mean to carry another person's burdens? Last week I shared how my wife Emily and I had new foster children in our home. We didn't know how long we would have them. It could have been as long as six months But it ended up being far shorter by Tuesday of this week, just six days after they entered our lives, they were gone, off to a relative's home. We will continue to hold these children in our hearts and pray for them, but I'm still reflecting on this incredibly chaotic week that we've had, where I had no time to get anything done. Yet despite this, I felt more productive in a couple of days than I had in several weeks. I have to admit that I also felt that if one thing went wrong, if someone got sick or a vehicle broke down, we would have been in a world of trouble. 
We also saw dozens of people give so generously to support us. We had some meals delivered to our home. Some folks dropped off clothing, which was wonderful, so that these children, who had only the clothes on their back when they arrived, left with bags and bags of clothing and toys and school supplies. Transitions can be tough for children, but hopefully those items will make it just a little easier for them. So many people were quick to respond to the needs of our family, and I am truly grateful for it. But what I noticed the most was how challenging it can, can be to raise young children. Emily and I have always said two kids is enough for us. One parent for one child. If there's more children than parents, what are you going to do when they literally run in completely opposite directions? I've heard some parents say you have to change up your protection. You can't play man-to-man coverage anymore. You have to switch to a zone defense. Now, I know that works in football, but that is really, really hard to do in the family. How do you keep everybody in line when everybody wants something different? Then I think about how there are so many single-parent homes, and I am just in awe. We have two extra kids in our house for six days, and I am exhausted. Emily was literally sleeping in the hallway of our home to keep our two-year-old in his crib and out of the playroom in the middle of the night. Kudos to all parents out there who are making it happen for their children. I know there was a point for me this last week where I said, I've been away from parenting little ones for too long. What are the rules again? What are the principles I have to keep in mind to parent children well? And I remembered redirection for toddlers. They are easily distracted and forget what they were crying about two seconds ago. And I used that one to great effect. But for children in other stages, what are those rules? So I just happened to see a free parenting class on Facebook, which, mind you, never happens because I never go on Facebook. And I took the bait. I signed up and watched this session in the tiny bit of free time I had this last week. And in it, they mentioned all the things that can frustrate parents. We hate nagging. We hate punishing our children to get them to act. And I know kids don't like it much either. So it might seem like there is no way out of these destructive patterns. But incredibly, this person says, there is. There's a way out. Now, I know this isn't a parenting class. We are in church. You didn't come here to fix your kids. But if there are any parents that want to learn the secrets I now know from this free Facebook webinar, I'd be happy to share with it uh, after church uh, for a one-time fee of $19.95. I'm kidding, of course. The, The key point was that you need to be fair and you need to empower your children. How completely unfair it is to promise something and then take it away because of an unrelated situation. How unfair it is to not lay any ground rules and then tell them after the fact that they broke the rules. Also, children like choices. Let them know the consequences of an action and how a particular behavior benefits them. As I listened to all this advice, uh, it was clicking for me. Wait, this isn't just about children. This is about everybody. This is true for all human interactions. A community, even a church community, needs these kinds of rules so that it can function well, so people can feel happy and fulfilled. These rules seem to me to be part of what it means to carry the burdens of others. Let's let's walk through this scripture together and see if we can make the connection. The Apostle Paul encourages us to carry each other's burdens in Galatians 6. He was a part of this community in Galatia. He had helped form this community in modern-day Turkey. After continuing his missionary travels, he is writing a few years later to these people to try and help guide them. The big debate happening in this community was around circumcision and how it is that someone could become a follower of Jesus Christ. Paul had people get baptized and join the small churches that were meeting in people's homes. And the audience is a mix of people. Some of them are Jewish who decide to follow Christ, while others had a a different religious background. The Jewish Christians are saying, you have to be like us to be real Christians. So they want them to follow all their rules and customs. Paul's main argument through the rest of this book, though, is that becoming culturally Jewish 
does not make us any more righteous. His detractors are even pointing to the Bible. Look, it says right there you have to be circumcised to be the people of God. But Paul says, no, that's wrong. He says this requirement that you have for cultural Judaism, not only is it not meant for these other people, it's also driving people away from converting. How is that a part of the community that God envisions for us? Instead, he says, be open and welcoming and inclusive. So that's how we get to today's scripture in Galatians 6. Verse 1, if anyone is detected in a transgression, if you sin, if you are imposing the wrong thing on others, then Christians who have the Spirit of God alive and at work in them are the ones who should gently correct them, bringing them back to the right way. Then he says, bear one another's burdens. The main image here could actually be that of a slave or a servant, and all that would, would that they would do to serve their master, right? But it could also be the image from a soldier who could press someone into service. If a Roman soldier needed someone to carry a message for them, they could demand assistance from citizens. A soldier's basic equipment already weighed about 66 pounds, so they had a heavy burden already, right? Now, imagine you're a soldier who's just marched into a town, but you have to hand deliver a letter to someone in the town. You don't know quite where you're going, and you are already exhausted from the journey. The law was that a soldier could force anyone he found to go up to one mile and deliver that letter for him. It would relieve him of the burden, not only of the distance he had to travel, but also of all that weight from his equipment. Most people hated this. They'd have to drop everything they were doing and not only go the whole mile out of their way, they also had to travel the extra mile back to where they started to continue on with their business. Now, if this isn't bad enough, Jesus actually comments on this whole principle in Matthew 5. He says, if anyone forces you to go one mile, go also the second mile. So if you have to carry that letter two miles now, doubling the destination, you are also doubling the distance now. You aren't going just two miles, you are going four. This is even more inconvenient. But that is what it means to bear one another's burdens. And Paul tells us this is what it means to fulfill the law of Christ. In chapter 5 he said, the law is summed up with this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Help those that are in need. Take on that inconvenience to do good for others. To help, to love, to bless them. And let them know that God loves them and has not forgotten them. It also includes the burden of helping to correct someone who has sinned. That's a tough thing to do well, and that's part of what God's love looks like. Now, as Paul continues to make his argument, you might think he's backing off this idea because he says, for all must carry their own loads. That sounds way more American, doesn't it? Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Your problems are your own, so work hard and fix it. The Greeks, who culturally dominated this period of time, had a similar saying, each one shall bear his own load. Paul is probably quoting it here. And it means just what you think it does. Be self-sufficient. Take care of yourself. But that's not really what Paul is saying here. The apostle has written a couple of verses that are really confusing for us today uh, because what he's doing is flipping this cultural phrase on its head. He's not reversing course and denying the assistance we give to others. In emphasizing humility while dealing with others, he is saying that the load each of us must carry for ourselves is the responsibility of answering to God for what we do. It's a clever twist. He makes it a little clearer in verse 7 where Paul says, you reap whatever you sow. Those are farming terms for planting and harvesting. Sow in the flesh, reap in the flesh. But if you sow or plant in the spirit, you reap or harvest in the spirit too. 
So the burden each of us carries individually is having to answer before God about what we did with this life. Harvesting spiritually means we helped others. We blessed them. We loved them. We made this world a better place with how we used our time and talent. So each of us, when we go before God, have to answer with what we did with our lives. Were you living by the Spirit? Were you angry? Were you fighting? Were you taking sides? That breaks the community. That's not what God calls us to. That destroys the very thing that God calls us to. And the apostle rounds out the way we ought to live by coming back to his main point. Whenever we have an opportunity, let us work for the good of all, and especially for those in the family of God. There are so many things we could do to work for good, to make the world better. The possibilities, I think, are really endless. And I think part of the beauty of the Christian life is that there's no specific formula for it. We are all free to do whatever kind of good we want to do. We just have to make sure our commitment is actually for the good. Not just pretending to stand for good when all we're really doing is fulfilling our own wishes or desires, our own agenda. Just do good things. Be that blessing. That's why we don't act like a church that has it all together and everybody else out there is wrong. No, we, we know lots of people are doing good. And we just want to join in with the rest of God's kingdom making good things happen. Imagine what the world would look like if more and more people made that commitment. We aren't competing. We aren't putting others down or taking sides. We are just working to make more good things happen. I remember a season in my life when our children were very young. They were not good sleepers with multiple wakings every night for literally years. And in our exhaustion, just getting through the day felt like it was nearly impossible. We had a phrase we kept repeating to ourselves that I think helped us through that season. We just kept saying more good things. We wanted more good things in our life and we wanted to be a source of good things for others, even in our own suffering, even in our own exhaustion. We had to make sure that that was our focus, even as things around us were so tough to deal with. I think that's the apostles' message here. And we saw it last week with the clothing and food people brought to our house. Bless those children in any way you can, right? But don't miss this either. The very last word is that we work for the good of all, but especially for those in the family of faith. When people in our own faith community are hurting, we need to drop everything to assist. This is a message for me, too, since I'm often the first person to hear about when people are sick or in the hospital. It's also true that helping others needs to be balanced with raising a family and other considerations in our lives. But we've got to prioritize taking care of our own. When you join this church family... You become our top priority. We will be there when you are hurting. We will keep working for the good of the whole church, period. Some of you have heard about one of our Sunday school teachers, Sarah Schertz, and how she was given a cancer diagnosis a few weeks ago. The doctors, even before they got to the full results of her tests, immediately put her on chemotherapy. When I spoke with her, she was very upbeat. She was even cheerful that whatever may come, she would face it with God at her side. She may have been diagnosed with stage 4 cancer, but there's a new drug and the doctors are hopeful. She carries this burden with hope. And I want to urge you to help her carry it. I want to encourage our church to Put aside the other concerns you have and do some good for our own people that are hurting. At the end of your pew, there should be some blank index cards. Actually, I believe they're in with the Bibles. Uh, right in front of the Bible should be an index card. I want you to take a minute here uh, 
and invite you to write down something of how you can be a blessing to those that are hurting in our own church. Some folks have already told me that they are going to donate some money to Sarah. Some of you may want to volunteer some time to help or a meal for a family that you know. I know more than one of you will commit yourself to pray every day for the next month for those in our church who need a touch from God. Others will send a card or give a call to offer support and ask how you might be able to help carry this burden. You only have to go one mile today. But Jesus says to go two. What does that second mile look like? I invite you to write down a name of someone who's hurting. Maybe it's Sarah or another person from our church who you know is in need. If you are new with us and maybe don't know the needs in this church, pick someone you know. The ushers, they're going to collect the cards in just a moment. If you need a little extra time, feel free to give the card to an usher at the end of today's service. As the music plays, let's write how we will carry the burdens of one another. And I, I invite the ushers to collect those cards, but let's pray. Lord, we pray that we would be a faith community that supports one another. This is a foundational element of being a church. We care for each other. We support each other and reach out when someone is hurting. It's easy to forget about another's pain or to tell someone to carry their own burdens, but that's not what you call us to. You call us to do good, especially when it involves our own church family. Help us to be a light and to make good come out of an awful situation. We also pray for Chris and Becky on the birth of their baby. Continued prayers for Jana. We lift up Chris Cotta as she continues on the difficult road to recovery. Prayers for Christine as she recovers and works with the youth group. Lord, we think of young Jackson and his surgery on this past Thursday. We also remember today Florence Potts, whose daughter gave a small blessing to the church this week. Lord, we lift up these needs to you, knowing that you are a good God, that you are with us in any situation, and that we can always trust in your love and goodness. And so we pray now as you taught your disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. For everything happening at Grace, check out our website at gumc.org.